Host. Got it. All right. Am I host? You are now host. Thank you all for dealing with our technical difficulties. We are we are going to start. Thank you. Go. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Durkin, and I'm the CEO here at the Arc Baltimore, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight. So I'm not staying long because I know we're all looking forward to hearing directly from our curators about the art that they've selected for this year's Art in the Round. But I want to start by thanking each of you for your continued support of the Art Baltimore and this year's virtual Art in the Round event. We were so excited about the responses last week at our kickoff event, and if you missed it, no worries. Everything's available on our website, which is www.thearcbaltimore.org, and this is some of what you'll find there. So we have a short video on Nadia Strawballs, one of the artists in this year's exhibit. There's a link to the virtual art gallery with an exhibit of 50 pieces of art, and I promise it's a really fun way to view the art. There's a link to Handbid, so you can get registered to bid on the art, and a reminder that the silent auction opens next Monday. And there's a video about our Color Our World crowdfunding campaign to support the ARC's COVID relief work. If you have not yet contributed or considered your own personal fundraising page, it's all there and available to you. So we appreciate your contribution to our mission. At this time, we want to thank our presenting sponsor, Scientific Plant Service, for supporting this year's virtual event. We really hope that we see Brian Haga and his team in person next year. And thank you to our other top sponsors, the Miter Box, Wegmans, United Healthcare, Blades and Rosenfeld, Capital Services, Lockton, Mutual of America, PDP Group, and Summit Financial. And so without further ado, I'm gonna say farewell and turn things over to our moderator for the evening, Mr. Chris Norline, our Director of Development here at the ARC, and our IT talent and brain behind this year's virtual event. So thank you so much, Chris, and take it away. So IT talent is a little ironic with a 15 minute late technology start, but um, I wanted to welcome everyone joining us here for Curator Night. I, I personally am very excited. Um, uh, we we're gonna have a great hour of discussion uh, that will not disappoint, so let's jump right in. Um, we're fortunate to have six influential members of the Baltimore art community with us here tonight. Um, and they're gonna speak about a variety of topics. Um, each curator selected a piece of art from our Art in the Round exhibit, um, and we'll discuss why they made their decision. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on in their world, um, and we'll also have a discussion at the end about the intersection of art and disability. Um, so let me just get the screen up here to the right, left. There we go. All right, so everyone should be able to see us as well as uh, the individual artwork. Um, so first off uh, is George Sissel, the Curator in Residence Emeritus at the Maryland Institute College of Art, uh, who has mounted groundbreaking exhibitions and taught courses in the fine arts and humanities for close to 50 years. He founded and directed the Contemporary, as well as the Exhibition Development Seminar, Curatorial Studies Concentration, and the MFA in Curatorial Practice at MICA. George selected abstract angels that you can see to your right um, by Chuck Fisher. Um, so George, what drew you to that piece? Well, at first glance, um, this is a sort of a painting kind of composed of vibrant pink and blue abstractions. Um, there's these shapes that sort of take form of a landscape with sky and, and ground. And I found that the, the title, Abstract Angel, that, that emerges from this sort of kind of a magical environment with their body and wings that you can see that contain various flowers and, and animals. But what, what intrigued me the most, I think, about this painting was the fractured globe of the world that the angel appears to almost be protecting 
from further harm. Perhaps Chuck Fisher, the artist, is bringing attention to the circumstances we are, we are in now. Thank you, Thank George. You. I, I actually was fortunate enough to film an artist profile of Chuck um, that will debut at the event next Friday. Um, and he's an incredible person, incredible artist, and I just, I, I love his style. So thank you for the analysis on that. Um, all right, let's see. So I'm gonna go back to gallery view and then we're gonna um, spotlight Asma. Um, so next month, next up is Asma Naim. She is the Eddie C. and C. Sylvia Brown uh, Chief Curator. Sorry, let me make sure I move the screen. There we go. Um, at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, and she's a specialist in American art and contemporary Islamic art. Before this, she was the curator, curator of prints, drawings, and media arts at the Smithsonian's Ooh. National Portrait Gallery. Many of her curated shows have won prestigious awards. Her work has been published in many prominent art magazines, and she has published two books on silhouettes and sound technology and power in American art. Uh, Asma selected Fireworks by Faith McLucky. Asma, can you tell us why you like this painting? Or um, thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, Kathleen, and hello, ARC members. Um, this is my first time being part of this special evening, and I'm thrilled. Um, there were so many important, beautiful works to choose from, but on to fireworks um, by Miss McLucky because of the colors. Um, the reds, the blues are really strident, and then you have that sharp contrast with the green. And for me, I immediately started to think of um, Gauguin and Van Gogh and the ways in which they were pushing against each other and um, playing with uh, opposite color tones to create these really strident um, feelings. And that's the other thing that really drew me to this work is the feelings. Um, it's titled Fireworks. And when you're watching fireworks, you kind of and looking up and seeing something quiet up into the air and then there's a pause and then suddenly everything shoots out in this beautiful array and it's that kind of pause that I feel like we're leading up at the bottom of the work and then we're suddenly in the spray in that beautiful moment when things are popping out and so you have these lines that are straight and you have these lines that are squiggly um, and it just made me think like I'm in the fireworks themselves and I'm also kind of looking up at the fireworks themselves. So I like how she made us feel like we were part of it. And of course, since I write about sound, I, I felt like I could hear the sounds from the lines and the colors. So I thought it was a really magical work with a lot of emotion and a lot of heart and um, fire. That's, that's wonderful. I never even thought about the sound of when you're experiencing it. That's and very interesting. Um, well, thank you, Asma, I appreciate that. Um, so let's see, Gary, I'm gonna unmute you and then I'm gonna spotlight you. Um, so next is Gary Vegan, um, the retired director of the Walter, Walters Art Museum from 1994 to 2013. Gary was appointed by President Clinton in 1999 to his Cultural Property Advisory Committee and was knighted by the French Minister of Culture and the Order of Arts and Letters in 2002. In retirement, Gary writes, lectures, and teaches, and has published numerous books with his next, um, with his next being My Father Took Pictures that's slated to be published in early 2021. Gary selected um, Blue Race Angel by Andrew Pope. Um, Gary, can you tell us, tell us a little bit more about your selection? Uh, sure, I will. Hey, by the way, Chris, did you go to Villanova or am I mistaken? <laughs> it's a mild, mild obsession, yes. Yes. Well, thank you. Good. It's good to be proud. I have Carlton on my show. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Well, um, 50 choices is hard. Mm -hmm. And there's so many good ones. And so I went through them quickly. And one of them really stuck with me first time through. And I was puzzled by that. And then I remembered Malcolm Gladwell's book called Blink. And the idea is sort of like speed dating. The idea being that somehow there's some intuitive quality going on, a nonverbal part of your brain 
that makes decisions for you that you don't even have to articulate or think about. And I went through it again and again and again, and that blue fish kept coming up. <laughs> now, do I know why that was so? No. I'm interested in why that's so, and I'm sort of puzzled over it. I love the colors. I love the patterns. I love the, I love the kind of almost maniacal repeating of the scales and the fins. And that fish, to me, is sly. It's clever. And fishes always seem to be sly and clever. They seem to move effortlessly and somehow to be entertaining on purpose without trying. So what am I left with in the end? A puzzlement as to why I care about that one in particular. But an absolute conviction that I do. And I trust my intuition. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, Andrew Pope, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. All right. Um, so next is Amy. I'm going to um, make sure I get you spotlit here. There we go. Perfect. Um, so next is Amy Eva Raish. Um, she is the executive director and partner at Goya Contemporary Gallery. Um, Raish has curated over 100 exhibitions and has placed artworks in major public and private collections worldwide, including MoMA, the Met, and the Smithsonian, to name a few. In her 20 plus, plus years in the field, uh, Race has, has taught at a number of colleges and universities and lectures on professional practices as well as sits on numerous boards. Amy selected Kids Playing by Gregory Bannister to our right. Uh, Amy, can you tell us a little bit more about your reaction to this piece? Absolutely. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Kathleen and my esteemed colleagues. Um, and Gary swiped my Villanova too, so mad at you for that. Um, but uh, this was a difficult decision. There were so many spirited works. Um, and I have to say that all of the artists should feel, feel really, really, really good about what they've accomplished and everybody should be celebrated equally. Um, in my decision-making process, I eventually came to Gregory Bannister's work. Um, it topped the chart for me because of its complexity and because of Gregory's authentic and humanistic approach to image making. Um, in many ways, his work allows us to see um, as an active rather than a passive act um, because it's very vivacious. And, um, and the work is incredibly engaging. Gregory is liberated and raw, even visceral marks um, paired with his innovation and energy and experimentation reveal uh, Gregory's ability to tap into the depths of his pure emotion. Um, and to me, that was pretty remarkable. Um, I felt connected to the artist in a very personal way. Um, within his work, I saw hints or nods to uh, celebrated and honored artists such as Dubuffet or Picasso or Basquiat, um, particularly when it came to Gregory's uh, urgency of forms and his incredibly dynamic use of color. Um, he took something that's in the vernacular of the everyday. He took uh, children playing, and we can all relate to that. But what Gregory gives us beyond the imagery of children playing is that inner emotional connection to him, which also allows the viewer to connect to their own emotion. Um, so I'm always appreciative of a work that reveals the, the courage that someone has to put their emotions forward um, and also leaves plenty of room for the viewer to interpret. So for me, I thought Gregory's work was a knockout. Thank you, Amy. We, we, we here at The Ark absolutely love Gregory and hit, him dropping off his artwork for submission is an uh, event in and of itself because we're always excited to see what he's bringing. So we, we, we all absolutely love this. So thank you. Oh, I'd love to meet Gregory one day. I think he's probably a remarkable human being. He is. He's fantastic. Yep. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Let's now we get a, um, 
Jeffrey, I'm going to unmute you and then I'm going to spotlight you. Okay. All right, perfect. So next is Jeffrey Kent. Uh, Jeffrey uh, is an artist and the artistic director for the Peel Center for Baltimore History and Architecture. Kent combines dramatic gestures, vivid colors, multiple layers, uh, pardon me if I pronounce this incorrectly, impasto, and reverse text in his paintings. His artworks are in the collections of National Academy of Sciences, Robert W. Deutsch Foundation, Hilton Hotels, FTI Consulting, among others. In addition, he founded and or owned Sub-Basement Artist Studios, Unexpected Art Space, um, uh, Connect and Collect, and he is the Director of Promotion and Outreach for Be More Art. Um, Jeffrey selected Sheep by Mara Clausen. Um, Jeffrey, can you tell everyone why you made that selection? Wow, well, I want to thank you for this opportunity and again, thank all my colleagues and I really love you, George Sissel. I just want to say that in public. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. You know, the second best thing that I love besides making art is looking at art. And this opportunity just helped that endeavor in my life of enjoyment. Uh, Mara's artwork came out to me mostly because of the color, the bold and powerful color and the use of contrast, which is something that I'm automatically drawn to because it's something that I choose in the way that I express myself in my work. And the other things that drew me to this work was the fact that it reminded me of uh, post-impressionism. Uh, again, like Van Gogh, uh, Munch it has expressive power of color, and it also discards the idea of careful study and the efforts of color and light in nature. And I like how it has this big, beautiful sheep that you can feel the fluffiness of it when you look at it, it's just so fluffy. That if you thought of what a sheep feels like and you look at this painting, you automatically would think that is a fluffy sheep. And I just felt so fluffy looking at it. And I also thought that when I look at this painting, it brought a, a childhood memory. It brought two childhood memories, I should say. One was the fact of when I was really young, and hanging out in the big sands of Cape Cod, the big grass uh, in Cape Cod. And it kind of reminds, even though this is not a beach scene, it still had that feel of that memory for my youth. And also as a youth, the very first time I saw a Van Gogh painting was probably the, the, the wheat fields with crows. And it has that same feeling of that painting for me. I should say, because everyone brings their own expression and their own ideas when they look at art. And this is what I get. I love the the, the colors of the rocks are, are orange and red and pinks and lavenders. And these are all very great feelings. Of, these are, They make me feel good when I look at them, these colors. And I really appreciate what Mara did in this work. And I, I also agree that it was very hard to select the work, but because I only had to choose one, I remembered seeing this one when I went through the list and I went back to this one more than once and it made it very easy for me. So I really thank Mara for making this work and all of the artists for giving me the opportunity to look at the work that they did. Thank you, Jeffrey. This, this is probably my favorite as well. It's definitely one that stood out to me. So I, I, lo I love hearing your insight about it. Thank you. Um, so last but not least, let me get uh, Kara up here. Right, there we go. So last but not least is Kara Ober. Uh, Ober is an artist, an award-winning arts writer, curator, and the founding editor and publisher at Be More Art, Baltimore's art and culture magazine. She writes regularly about artist, museum, and material culture with emphasis on context and subtext in the art world. Ober has published articles in Vulture, New York Magazine, Art Papers, Art News, The Baltimore Sun, and many more. Kara has also taught classes and lectured at MICA, Johns Hopkins, American University, UMBC, and Goucher College. Kara selected Flower 
Without a Vase by Nadia Strasbaugh. Kara, what did you like about this piece? Oh, thank you, Chris, for the introduction. And um, thanks, thanks everybody. It's, it's really fun to be in this context talking about this work tonight. Um, so, and I'm, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing the artist's name correctly. You, and I think someone pronounced her name differently earlier. So it's Nadia Strasbaugh. Strauss, Strauss Ball. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, with this particular painting, I was really attracted to the physicality of it. And by that, I mean, it looks like it looks like it wasn't painted with a brush. Mm -hmm. It looks like the artist used some sort of other tool and they, I, I, I just, I love sort of um, when I'm looking at a painting, when I can see the material that was used and I have to figure it out. How did the artist do this? They didn't use a brush. And so to me, it looks like they, they did some sort of thing where they put a lot of paint on the canvas and created some sort of tool like a squeegee or a sponge or something. And, and kind of, they didn't mix the colors together, but they sort of blended them and made these energetic stripes across the canvas. Um, so for me, immediately, this reminded me of like a Morris Lewis pour. Um, it reminded me of the uh, Washington color school. Um, and so this is a group, um, you know, fairly local Washington's close by, but, um, in the 1950s and 60s, this group um, created these, you know, very non-objective abstract works. And, um, but they're not ab abstract expressionists. So they're much more orderly. You know, there's sort of like a, there's a direction, there's a pattern, there's sort of an overwhelming um, structure to these paintings. So for me, this was something that I, I liked about this work as well. Um, and then there's also... Um, this intense um, close-up view of a flower, and it's it's a very abstract floral shape, but you definitely see that in the very beginning. Um, it's immediate, and um, I don't know. There's just the sensuality about the the repetition and the sort of fluted shapes of those flowers. Um, I thought it was feminine in a way that felt strong and. Um, I like the way the color and the form sort of merged together. And then initially I thought it was sort of on raw canvas, the way the color field painters would, would work. But then when you look closer, the artist actually took a lot of time in preparing a sort of neutral field behind those floral forms. Um, and when you get in really close and again, Looking at art on a screen is not ideal. It's always ideal in person or more ideal in person. Mm -hmm. But um, you can see all of these subtle details in the background where they have sort of this, um, just like a, a tan color that's sort of neutral, but then all of these other colors sort of embedded in it. And then it's interesting to see the colors um, sort of subtly in the background and then repeated in a much more... Um, you know, in a much stronger, brighter way um, with the forms on top. And I don't know, it just looked like the artist was having a good time. They were experimenting with materials. Mm -hmm. It's not too perfect. It's not too neat, but it has a ton of just energy and, um, and spirit to it. So Great. that was my pick. Well, thank you, Kara. Um, coincidentally, yeah. the other artist profile that we debuted last week at our kickoff event is about Nadia and, and her process. So it will be very enlightening so you can see how she does this type of artwork. She is fascinated with a variety of different mediums. So it's very interesting artist. So thank you. For That's that. great. All right. Yeah. All right. So let's let's move on. Um, Kara, we're going to stay with you um, because we have you up. Um, can you tell us uh, what exciting things are happening with uh, Be More Art magazine? Sure. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been an interesting few months and, um, we have a team of, uh, four people that work for Be More Art full time. And then we have other, uh, partners and collaborators that we work with. Jeffrey is one of those, one of those people. And, um, we really had to change our entire process mm -hmm. to accommodate for COVID. So one of the things we do is we have an online magazine. So we produce stories every single day. 
So our team was pretty rapidly um, able to, to change the way that we work and work from home and create this content. And we really wanted to create stories that would um, support artists in Baltimore and not just visual artists, but, you know, chefs and restaurants and musicians. So, so we were really, um, we had a lot of fun um, sort of brainstorming ways that we could create stories that would make other people want to, you know, buy art, support other artists, support other entities so that these, these creative things and people and organizations are, are still here after COVID is over. So that was one goal. Um, the other main thing that we do is we produce a, a print publication twice a year. So um, there were a lot of obstacles there once COVID hit. But uh, what we did was end up um, designing a new subscription service, which is something we had never done. Um, and just putting it out in front of our, our readers if, if they wanted to buy a subscription to get the next two issues. And then that gave us some some stability. So we have issue nine that just came out. Oh, wow. It's very beautiful. It has all sorts of art and artists and amazing work. So if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll check it out. And now we're um, steam, steaming ahead towards issue 10 in, in December. Um, the last thing I'll tell you about is um, Be More Art opened a gallery space last year called Connect and Collect. And the idea was to support artists and to try to make introductions between artists and people who collect and also to inspire new collectors. And after our second show opened, everything had to be shut down. And we still, he's my dog's tail here. He, we still haven't been able to have people into the space. But what we've done, um, it has huge glass windows that face onto Charles Street and even in the first two shows, we had artists create installation work specific for that window. Um, so now what we've done is we had the windows frosted and we purchased a projector. So now we are screening artists' videos, animations, slideshows of work. And it's every night um, in these giant windows in the front of our space. So the space is uh, 2519 North Charles. So it's in uh, Lower Charles Village. And if you're driving up Charles Street after it's dark, um, you can see the art. So we've had a few outdoor um, socially distant receptions and it's just felt really good to put art in front of people that wouldn't normally see it and to you know, give artists an opportunity to, to continue showing their work. But you know, for a lot of people, they don't, they don't even go to events. So at least people can be inside their cars, they can drive by, um, and they can experience this work. So that's it. That's all. We've, we've been busy. It's been, it's been good. It's so okay. thank you. No problem. Thank you, Kara, for sharing. That's, that's very good. Sure. Um, all right, so we're going we're gonna to go over to Jeffrey. Let me spotlight there. All right, great. Um, so thank you, Kara. The, um, um, we're going to continue in reverse order that we started. So uh, Jeffrey, what is happening with either your own uh, work or your work at the Peel Center? Wow. <clears throat> uh, let's see. My, my ongoing art practice is still happening. I'm working on an autobiography through telling my story through my art. So it's really a long process of making art to tell a story. So it's really a long process. The other thing with the peel, I guess I'll just jump into that. I uh, just finished putting together and starting an exhibition of an artist. Her name is Kim Rice. She's a Baltimore based artist, a transplant that recently moved here that I met at one of the Connect Collect uh, events that we had at the gallery. I guess it was the first artist of it, or public event that we had at the gallery. And I did a studio visit with her and her work just knocked me out, um, primarily because it was work by a white artist that was informed by white privilege in a way that goes as far back as her great-great-grandfather's will, which is on exhibit and cut out of a colonial map and creates, cast a shadow of the will on the wall, which has people gifted 
or whatever you do, inherit left. So inheritance. As a matter of fact, that's the name of the exhibition, Inheritance. Uh, Kim Rice Inheritance. Um, so that I'm pretty I'm really proud of her work and the proud of the opportunity to present this body of work because I mean it's it's mostly conceptual work that she has take I mean some of the works are for example she's taken magazines and cut out all of the white flesh of magazines and woven them into large tapestries that are like museum sized tapestries. I mean, they're really huge, uh, 13 foot pieces. She has a piece that she uh, created that makes the shape of the Mississippi River. She was once a resident of uh, New Orleans during Katrina. As a matter of fact, she moved from there during Katrina. And she points out how, because she's white, she was able to move on, move to Baltimore, finance a home in Canton and so forth and so on. So. Um, I'm pretty proud of that work at the Peel. It'll be up until uh, the end of the year mm. of uh, this year, 2020. And uh, also just working with artists and trying to help lift other artists here in Baltimore as much as possible. And working with Kara as much as possible to try to, again, create and make inclusion for artists and people of color here in Baltimore, which, yeah, I'll just That's leave great. it at that. Thank you, Jeffrey. That, that was very interesting. I'm, I'm very excited to see that installation or the exhibition. Um, I hope so. P please, please go to the peel.org okay. and schedule a private. We are doing private small groups of five or less mm -hmm. um, to see the exhibition. So anyone can schedule a tour, which, um, we will try to make it possible so that I can be there to give you a private tour. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so we're gonna move on to Amy. Um, Amy, um, can you, let's see, can you tell us what's happening at the Goya Contemporary Gallery? Sure thing. Um, well, in this interminable pandemic, we've been trying to be as supportive and productive as possible including porch drops of food and supplies to artists with whom we work, who have some physical limitations. Um, we've been facilitating a lot of legacy projects for the artists that we work with because we fully commit to our artists for um, a lifetime of support, protection, and uh, fiduciary responsibility. We just released a 144-page artist book for the South African born Baltimore based artist, Joe Smell. And Joe currently has an exhibition up in our uh, gallery spaces at Goya Contemporary. And then we also have her work up in a show um, at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Uh, the Baltimore Museum of Art's exhibition is much more of a retrospective look at Joe's work where our work um, in our space is, is more of a current view of her practice from the last about 10 to 12 months. Um, and the book is in celebration of both exhibitions and also in celebration of representing Jo and her career for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, so we've also been, um, moving a fairly analog business to digital culture because the, much of the work that we show and represent is really meant to be seen in person. Um, so moving works on to a digital platform is not always easy, but we've developed a program that um, we are creating content for collector groups and museum friends groups so we do digital tours um, through our archives, through um, studio visits of artists and through the gallery. And we, we do collector tours um, and museum friend groups tours about once a week. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working with several museums on exhibitions for other artists that we represent as well. MacArthur Genius Fellow Joyce J. Scott, who we've represented as her primary gallery for 20 years. Elizabeth Talford Scott, um, who George um, is 
more than familiar with since he did the seminal show of Elizabeth Telford Scott's work um, years back. Um, and then Sonia Clark, who we work with and will open up her show at the um, Museum of Women in the Arts um, towards the end of this year, actually. So that's all pretty exciting. We're also in the midst of the IFPDA Print Fair. Uh, IFPDA is the acronym for International Fine Print Dealers Association. That event is typically at the Park Avenue Armory and the Javits Center in New York, but because of COVID had to move online. Um, the event's pretty interesting because it hosts the world's top print dealers who are selected to be part of this organization because their focus is on integrity, ethics, and scholarship around editions and prints. So um, we're happy to be in the middle of, of that and moving it uh, online has been interesting, but everybody's been fluid and amazing throughout all of these processes. Um, and then we're gearing up for the larger November auctions. Um, we have a secondary market practice where we work closely with Philip Sotheby's and Christie's auction houses um, and where Personally, I'm doing a lot of writing. I'm part of a think tank in New Jersey that I'm excited about. Um, and I've done more cooking in my non-domestic <laughs> life than I've ever done in 46 plus years. So um, the pandemic has brought me uh, basically to a new uh, vernacular of ingredients, um, which I'm, I'm kind of treating like a painting. So Wonderful. that's what I've been up to. And that's what we've been up to. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you for sharing. Um, all right. So Gary, we're going to move on to you. I'm going to ask to unmute. So Gary, would you like to share what's going on in your world? Uh, I would, if I knew. Um, <laughs> When I retired from Walter Lowe's many years ago, I was intent on becoming a writer. And I think I have become a writer, at least to the extent that a writer writes books, and I've written books. And I think we've gotten better at writing since I started writing. So in both cases, I think I'm in a new career. Uh, one book came out, uh, the third one since I retired, in uh, May of this year. It's on the Shroud of Turin. And uh, A Brilliant Hoax in the Time Black Death is his title. And my fourth one comes out either at the end of this year or early next year, and it's called My Father Took Pictures. And it's my childhood memoir from the time I have my first memories around 1950 to the time I went to college in 1964. My father was uh, the publisher and photographer for a small newspaper in northern Minnesota. And when he died, he left me... Um, couple thousand negatives and several hundred prints and it's from these that I have reconstructed my life and growing up years in this little town and that was a pleasure to write and as I say that's coming out at the end of this year or early next year. Um, I also have a kind of avocational interest in, um, in art and the brain. Um, this started when I was still at the Walter and we did a couple small exhibitions devoted to the intersection of brain science and the aesthetic experience. Beauty in the Brain was one of them. And then that kind of grew into a session at the Salzburg Global Seminar that I co-chaired with a neuroscientist from Hopkins uh, a couple years back. And my most recent stab at this, and I was involved in the creation of a neuroaesthetic center at Johns Hopkins University, which I think is the first in the United States and the second in the world. Um, but my most recent interest in how the brain works with art is, uh, is an article I wrote called Icons in the Brain, and it's about how we see faces and how the faces we see, we translate into affect or emotions and a kind of emotive interaction. And uh, it's, it's a kind of very tentative field, um, but I find it very exciting. And, um, and I really enjoy being involved with people who, who care about that intersection. These are people who are involved in 
in brain science, brain chemistry, and yet are drawn to art, or in a few cases, and they're very rare, I think, people who are involved in art and care about brain function. So I'm in the latter category, and it's it's a new field, and I find it kind of interesting, and I feel lucky to be part of it. So that's, that's sort of what I'm up to. Wow. That sounds fascinating. Thank you, Gary, for sharing. I appreciate that. Um, Asma, uh, let's let's move on to you. I'm going to unmute and then spotlight. Um, there we go. All right, so what, what's happening in your world at uh, the Baltimore Museum of Art? Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start... Um, with the virtual because we have um, created a suite of virtual experiences and platforms um, for our audiences to enjoy during this um, unprecedented time. And we have two that um, are particularly of interest, I hope for your viewers. Um, one is the BMA Salon, which offers a connection to a number of artists and artist collectives and galleries mm. in um, in Baltimore. And um, we're pleased to have several people um, represented in this chat today, um, tonight. So we have um, a number of works that you can link to and purchase through the BMA Salon website platform. Mm. Um, and you can support local artists and local galleries um, and then we also have the BMA Screening Room, which is a online platform to watch short films created by Baltimore-based artists. And um, that is truly an incredible way to pass time if you've binged everything, or even if you haven't binged everything um, that is possible. Um, and I have to say that uh, Jeffrey Kent has three works up wow. on our BMA uh, Screening Room website uh, so run do not walk uh, to your laptop to watch those um, so that's one of our um, virtual experiences um, if you want to kind of move from the laptop into your actual physical space and come towards the museum we have an array of outdoor experiences that we've created um, in a walking tour starting with the most beloved of gardens um, and ending with our spring house on our um, other end of the campus and uh, the west side of the campus where we're feeding a, um, a wonderful animated film. Mm. Excuse me. And I will also say that um, we have opened. <laughs> wow. um, and it's been um, about, uh, I think, an, in, in a graduated state of, uh, so we have now opened approximately 70% um, of the building, um, and we are welcoming visitors to three exhibitions that have opened. Um, the most recent one is Stripes and Stars, Recla Reclaiming Lakota Independence, um, which looks at these incredible beadwork objects made by the Lakota people of North and South Dakota at a time when the United States government was oppressing them and taking away many of their freedoms. And uh, the beadwork is quite beautiful, inspiring, and includes patriotic imagery. We also have an exhibition devoted to the second female director, Adeline Breeskin. Um, and that exhibition primarily looks at the works that brought in, which were an extraordinary amount, um, from the Cone Collection uh, to her work in commissioning the US Pavilion for the 1960 Venice Biennale, to some really wonderful stunning prints that um, I could just spend hours looking at. And lastly, we have the Perfect Power Motherhood and African Art that just opened. Um, this is a landmark show featuring an unprecedented amount of loans um, and collection objects that talk about the ways in which power in the central belt of Africa was passed through the line, the maternal line. Mm -hmm. And the um, power was expressed through um, through those gendered forms. It's very beautiful. And next week we hope to open Kandi Sprites, Too Long Didn't Read, which um, looks at issues of immigration and our very short attention span. And speaking of a short attention span, I realize I have gone on <laughs> okay. and I will turn it over to George. Okay, great. 
I'm going to th thank you so much, Aspen. That was fantastic. Um, all right, I'm going to unmute George and then spotlight him. So, George, tell us what's happening in your, tra your, your travels around the art community. Well, I would say, like, prior to March the 15th, my, my, my whole life was really around my volunteer work, especially with, with the ARC. And last year's um, Beyond the Four Walls campaign that raised enough money for me to start a mentorship program uh, with professional artists working with artists from ARC and, and also a fellowship for the curatorial practice program working with the day centers from ARC and also my uh, monthly ARC visits with the day centers at the BMA, the Walters, Baltimore Clay Clayworks and, and School 33. Since March 15th, however, things certainly have shifted, and they really are 100% about art in the round. Mm -hmm. And trying to, in the selection, the promotion, and the sale of the 50 artist works, that certainly our wonderful colleagues and friends uh, tonight were a major part of. Mm -hmm. And then um, the... Um, the crowd uh, source fundraising campaign, mm. the Color Our World campaign, mm. that ARC, that that Kathleen referred to, that the organization is trying to raise fifty thousand dollars on, mm. and of that, I have my personal fundraising goal of five thousand mm. dollars to to raise uh, from friends and and and, and colleagues, uh, hopefully to reach that. So that's really been. Um, my my uh, concentration and, and focus, which I'm really happy to be able to have that at this point in time. Great. Thank you, George. And thank you for being instrumental in, in getting such incredible uh, speakers here tonight that are also uh, curators as part of our event. So thank you so much. We owe a debt of gratitude to you. Um, so I'm going to go back to gallery view so we can see we can finish up on our third part. Um, so to close out our event, um, we wanted to have a discussion on how disability and art intersect. Um, and George uh, wanted to open this up. Um, um, he's been instrumental in bridging these two worlds uh, through his volunteer work with the ARC um, and many other disability organizations in Baltimore. Um, so I'll let you take it away and we can, we can start. Thank you, Chris. Uh, this did, certainly did start with a conversation that I had with you about the really the representation of artists with disabilities in the larger art community. Mm -hmm. And I myself have been questioning what happens if and when we are free from labels of artists with disabilities or those identified as outsider artists. So I'd like to sort of open it up for sort of just a informal, freeform conversation uh, with my with the fellow curators here to chime in whenever you like, or or take it in a different direction if it relates to your work or practice around accessibility and representation. Don't be shy. Okay. So I was going to say, I could start with, with, with that from my own perspective. Um, being, uh, coming from the background that I come from, single parent, West Northwest Baltimore, grew up in the hood, sold drugs, did all these things, had learning disabilities, speaking of disability. I know you may be just speaking of I don't know if we're talking about physical disability or mental disability or is disability just a thing a that we're talking about. Um, but accessibility and feeling left out is something I always grew up with uh, here in Baltimore. Um, I never felt that Micah was reachable for me. I never felt that the life that I have was reachable. So I'm sure there are many people today that are growing up with the same feelings that I had of insecurity and but have much talent 
and have this inner glow that they want to share, but may have so much pain and trauma from being different that it makes it difficult. So how do we make it more accessible and inclusive for people who have challenges that we, the normal, do not? Um, that's a question I guess I will present to people who are more experienced in this world than I am. And just to, not to interrupt you, but just to add on that, Jeffrey, in terms of the work that the Peel has been doing recently around issues of accessibility uh, with people with, it, with uh, both intellectual, developmental, and physical disabilities, they have really reached out into the community uh, to do that. Even the, the exhibition before you did down there was dealing with the 30th anniversary of the ADA. Right, exactly. With, with Audrey, Audrey Buck. And uh, that was very interesting in itself in that fact that a lot of things, even for this presentation tonight, um, one of the things I was thinking about is how we didn't, I guess because I don't know what the audience is, but we can't take for granted that the audience always can see or hear what's being presented. And one of the things that Nancy has been very influential in trying to present for us as a team to always, when we're on Zooms, to discuss and describe ourselves, our surroundings, and to try to present a picture for people who can't see, who may just be listening, um, which gives them a, a, a opportunity to be included. Um, but around, I think the conversation also is about how to make art more, I mean, I mean the art of people who have differences and disabilities, because even people with disabilities, they, they appreciate the term disability, uh, which is something I've recently learned. Um, how do we make it more for artists who have disabilities to be shown to the public, curated, exhibited? And the concept of this, this curation started when we met with George and he, he's been able to bring these artists to a much higher platform, to a much larger audience. Um, and that's been huge for, for the, the many artists that, that um, submit for the, uh, the exhibition and, uh, and inevitable auction. Um, so that's the one thing that I'm, I'm grateful for from George. Um, and, and I think just hearing all of your analysis earlier in the program about the artwork, it was done respectfully and professionally um, and in no way you know, out of pity or anything along in, along those okay. lines, it was very respectful. Um, and that, and that well, also just to, just to add to that, Chris, you know, the ARC is not an insular institution, and they really are looking to have their what they refer to as their their clients out into the world, into the real world. And so, part of that was the the larger community, meaning you know the Walters and the BMA and you know School Thirty Three and Clayworks who opened up their arms and said, yes, please. We, you know, th that was a major impact to the people from ARC uh, in terms of what they were exposed to in terms of materials and techniques and, and, and mentorships. You know, I was going to add that um, actually in our most recent print issue, um, w the theme of the issue is craft, but we really broadly interpret what that might mean uh, and specific to Baltimore. But um, one of the stories that we included um, is about make studios. And so as in, in some ways, uh, similar with, you know, differently abled artists, people that are making art to show and to sell. And, and for us, it was really important that this story was part of this issue, but also just that we you know the way that we're writing about it is the same way that we're writing about any other art so it's going to show you this is like one of my favorite pages of this work yes that is 
That is how COVID, wait, there's one more. I'm going to show you one more. Um, but even this work, this work is so fantastic and it's detailed and, you know, it's, these are all artists and it's all art. So it, it just, it feels good to, um, to just have as much, uh, you know, diversity in terms of the artists that we're, we're looking at and writing about as possible. So, Carol, I'm not sure if you realize that both Amy's artist and my artist that we chose, two of the six art curator's choices are mixed studio artists. Oh, cool. I didn't know mm. that. <laughs> yeah. The and there's a couple name. others. There are a couple others among the other 50 that are also from mixed studio. And they have a That's very great. good, uh, we, they arc as a, and mixed studio has established a really, uh, you know, good re, a collegial relationship because of that. Amy, did you have something you were going to say? I'm sorry. I did. I was actually going to point out that, um, you know, art, it tells the story of our time. And we really cannot tell the story of our time without a diverse group of artists. So where artists are excluded because of race, because of religion, because of sexuality, because of challenges or cognitive differences, we fail in telling that full story of our time. So I think part of what we need to always remind all of our colleagues um, is that our differences are really our strengths. And as visual thinkers, not everything is articulated through, through the same path. And if we allow ourselves to be more fluid, to accept many different ways of obtaining knowledge, then we become greater communicators across the board in every discipline. And that to me is what working towards inclusion is about um, because representation isn't always inclusion. Inclusion mm -hmm. is about feeling that you belong, that people want to hear your voice. Being there isn't always the same as being included. And so, you know, we have to really do the work to make sure that all voices are included. That's actually part of our, our uh, vision for the Art Baltimore is um, that people are finding meaning and that their voices are heard um, and, and that they are valued. Um, it's so that's it just mirrored exactly our vision was mirroring exactly what you just said so thank you I, I have to add when in the 90s um i was working with the worcester art museum and at that time i was connected to that in massachusetts i was connected to a respite home called seven hills and i had developed a program with the worcester art museum um and our clients were adults who were um, cognitively challenged. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we brought the, our clients into the museum. They um, engaged with the collection and then went to the, the museum studios to make art after. And I have to say that for me, it was one of the most valuable experiences in my life because I personally learned so much about being open to all sorts of new ways of coming at looking at artwork. And I think, you know, we all have to remind ourselves we have different experiences and each experience is valuable and contributes to culture. You know, we're all part of culture. Gary, I think you Thank had your hand up as well that you wanted to say something. Uh, yes, with the idea that a disability um, in the world may be an ability in the art world, um, and Van Gogh is a perfect example, but I just read a biography of Glenn Gould, famous for the Goldberg Variations, the pianist who died in um, 1983. And he had many, many challenges in his life. Um, and in some respects couldn't function in the world, but it was that very mix of things in his head that made him a uniquely capable interpreter of Bach. Mm. And Beethoven was on the spectrum. 
he was he was he was the kind of person that if he didn't have his music, I I can't imagine what what life he would have had. Mm. So, in a way, art is a peculiar manifestation of the human spirit, and I don't think anybody has proprietorial ownership on the channel that leads you to that outcome. And so, uh, and George, I'm not the least bit surprised you do this. Um, if anybody in the last 30 years of my professional life in this town has been driven by values, the intersection of values and professionalism, you are that person. So thank you. Thank you, Gary. Well, I, I think that might be, oh, did you ask me, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. I, I don't think that there, um, I don't, I don't think I can follow all of the beautiful words that have been, um, and particularly the, the shining example that George um, brings um, to this conversation. But I will say that um, the stigmatization that um, comes with um, being considered not able-bodied, something that we are trying to address head on in the museum, both in terms of our visitors, in terms of the practitioners who we feature, and um, also in terms of staff. And there's a lot of work to be done. And the fact that um, we have a valuable institution advocates here um, in, in, the, in Baltimore City is something that I think is very important. And I will also say that art is the universal language as we all know. And it doesn't matter what you look like or what you can or can, your body can or cannot do, um, but it can always reach that divide. And so I very much believe in, in the power of art and in the power of folks who feel invisible um, to express themselves. And I'm here for, um, for those reasons. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for sharing. Um, I think that's a perfect uh, point to, to finish up. Um, so on behalf of the Art Baltimore, um, the artists uh, with disabilities that represented tonight as part of um, this curator night, as well as the many other artists as part of the exhibition. Um, I wanted to thank our esteemed guests um, for their participation in this event. This went far better, even with the technical glitch at the beginning, which I appreciate <laughs> you all for being patient, but this was fantastic. And I thought it was some really incredible discussion um, at the end there. So thank you all for um, being open and sharing your own personal connection to this topic. Um, so we hope to see many of you that are watching uh, with us next week uh, for our closing event for Art in the Round. Um, the gallery is open and up on our website and bidding can start on Monday throughout the week. Um, so we hope you join us next Friday uh, for the closing of Art in the Round. So thank you to everyone and good night. Um, and have a wonderful Friday and weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.